My name is Rick Salyer. I am the president and CEO of the James L. Stamps Foundation. And uh, the F Stamps Foundation has been in existence, this is our 50th year in existence. I am, I think, the fourth president of the organization. And uh, <clears throat> it's a great job to have. I, I spent 32 years as an attorney, I'm still an attorney, but as a trial litigator, and uh, it's an occupation where at least half of the people you deal with don't like you. And the job of giving away money, you become everybody's best friend. So it was a, a distinct uh, career enhancement for me. So uh, my various occupations have been, I've been an attorney, as I mentioned. I am a pastor at the First Baptist Church of Downey. I am the uh, pastor of adult Christian education. Um, I, uh, I am a professional photographer, which is Rick's favorite always is, <coughs> is, is that one. So um, I've been asked to come and speak to you today on uh, uh, the subject of uh, uh, basically the Christian perspective of wealth, and that is the difference between want and need and contentment. And uh, one of my primary jobs in the foundation, I'm the individual who receives the grant requests. And we receive on an annual basis somewhere in the area between 140 to 160 grant requests on an, on an uh, average year. It is my job to be able to ascertain uh, from the grant request uh, the difference between a want, a need, and in the process, when I reach that point of contentment, I know we have the uh, solution to the question of whether or not we will make the grant. And, and a great deal of the process of making a determination of what I do is based upon a Christian perspective of wealth. And, and I have to tell you, a Christian perspective of wealth is something that is, uh, in, in my life, changed over time. I, I remember when I graduated from law school, my uh, greatest desire at that point in time was to own a BMW. I was absolutely certain I was going to have a BMW, and by golly, I got my BMW when I went to work for, for a law firm. Today, I drive a 1993 Buick Regal, and I have a, a uh, 2003 Chevy truck. Those are our two vehicles. Amen, brother. <laughs> and, and my philosophy on uh, uh, vehicles is very simple. They're utilitarian. They get me from point A to point B. I don't need a concert hall. I don't need a massage. Uh, I don't need any of the stuff you read on TV. I need to get from point A to point B. And uh, uh, it's, it's a great thing to get to the point where you realize that and you can be content with understanding you don't need the BMW or the, the, the car. Not to say you won't have one at some point in time or you may not desire one. Um, as, I, as I talk about Christian, a perspective on, on wealth, one of the things that, that is significant is there's a difference between your generation and my generation. Okay? Uh, that difference is probably uh, best, uh, best signified or best, identified by a couple of things. I mean, for example, when I started college, when I first went into college, there was no such thing as a PC. There were mainframes, but they were just starting. And literally, the computers that we had at UCLA when I went to UCLA occupied an area probably twice the size of this room. And, and what we would do is we would get our projects together on punch cards and we would take our punch cards down and we would run our punch cards through a computer and this computer would spit out this report that was probably that thick on, and then you had to figure out what, what it meant. But the, you got the, the raw data basically off the punch cards is what you got. And, and it wasn't until well after I was out of college that the first PC was, was created. A, a second difference between your generation and my generation is the concept of worldview. You guys have probably grown up your entire life uh, having a discussion of worldview and what worldview meant. This was not a phrase that was even discussed in my life until I was probably mid 40s, somewhere in that range. An understanding of the fact that there is such a thing as a worldview and understanding what a worldview means. 
And, and when you start understanding the concept of a worldview being a prism through which you literally see and understand everything that you encounter, it defines for you the prejudices that you have, the education that you have, the experiences that you have, and, and it allows you then to understand everything that you encounter through that worldview. Okay? My worldview has changed drastically having gone through the various stages of life I have. When I was a lawyer, my worldview was when. And that was it. I mean, there were time periods in which uh, I can remember I was the head of litigation for a law firm and uh, I was particularly uh, talented in long cases. So I would take the cases that were 30 days and longer. And the reason I was particularly good at those cases is that I was particularly good at strategy. They're like a giant chess game. And so you would literally play one game after another after another and the objective was simply to win. You didn't care who was right, you didn't care who was wrong, you simply were there for the purpose of winning. As time goes by and your worldview becomes more defined and you start seeing things in different terms, you start realizing how shallow that understanding of life truly is. Um, <clears throat> two things that, that are very clear to me at this point in time. Absolutely everybody has a worldview. Whether they know it or not, absolutely everybody has a worldview. And, and that allows them to understand that which they encounter. One of those things, for example, that, that always helped me when I was an attorney, there's a phrase that I learned very young in life. It was called, a man does what a man believes, and a woman does what a woman believes, okay? That's a very helpful thing to understand. When you get somebody on a witness stand, for example, you can reverse engineer things by simply understanding what it is they did. If you can grasp what they did, you can understand from that what they believe. And once you understand what they believe, you've got them. You can work them every which way you want on a witness stand, and you can finally get them to say whatever you want them to say, but you first have to come to that, that understanding. <clears throat> Scripture puts it this way. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says, A good man brings forth out of, his, uh, out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. So what you do is you look at people and you watch what they do and you understand what they believe as a result of that. Now, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of where this applies in a, a Christian perspective, for example. We, uh, we do a lot of work with a number of ministries. We work with a total of about 450 different ministries. And even within those ministries, the way that you view things will show in, in actually what is done by the individual ministry. For example, there was a phrase that you may have heard. It, it's a, uh, a quote from Sir Francis Assisi. And it says, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words, okay? Now, I was, at a, uh, uh, I was in, in a, a church listening to a sermon being given by a pastor of discipleship who used that phrase. And, and it makes perfect sense for a pastor of discipleship to have that philosophy, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. A Couple weeks later, I was at a conference uh, with uh, Luis Palau and his wife, Pat. And Pat was speaking, and, uh, and, and Pat got up, and she mentioned that she had just heard this phrase, and she quotes this exact same phrase, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. And she looks up and she goes, what a stupid statement. Of course you have to use words. This is from an evangelist. From an evangelist, absolutely, the way that you would get the gospel across is by the use of words, versus someone who is in discipleship wants to use deeds. So where this comes down to is if you believe that money will solve all of your problems or that the accumulation of wealth is the goal of your life, your worldview will look dramatically different than the worldview presented in Scripture. Uh, there was a, a, a couple of bumper stickers that I saw once that, that kind of highlighted this to me. One of the bumper stickers on a car, and these two cars were parked right next to each other. The first car has a bumper sticker that says, he who dies with the most toys wins. The next bumper sticker on the car next to him says, he who dies with the most toys 
is still dead. <laughs> Psalms 39.6 says, Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. And, and so what you begin to see is that the way that you look at wealth will dictate to a great extent what you actually do. For example, I, I'll give you several of the ministries that we, uh, we work with at the foundation. Okay. Uh, our, our mission statement at the foundation is we equip others to do ministry by being faithful stewards of God's resources. And what we interpret that to mean is that, that we find ministries that are in existence, that have their funding in place for their general support, and then we buy them the assets they need to do what they do better. So we'll go into schools, for example, and, and we'll buy uh, the computers for a computer lab. Uh, we put the computers in the business school here, for example. We'll go into uh, uh, a church and, and we'll buy things for the church. If a church has an air conditioning unit that, that breaks down, we'll go in and we'll replace the air conditioning unit. We go into Christian camps. We do a lot of work with Christian camps, with Hume Lake, Thousand Pines, uh, uh, probably about six different Christian camps in Southern California. And, and we like to take the jobs on that are somewhat difficult. So uh, in both Hume Lake and Forest Home, for example, we go in and, and we replace the sewage treatment facilities in both of those, uh, those camps. These are the types of projects that are tough for a camp to be able to raise money for. Right? But, but as a result of that, the, the types of ministries that we get involved in are ministries that are out there on the front line doing the job, and, and we simply provide them with what they need to do. One of the uh, ministries that we were involved with is located in Sri Lanka. This is a very difficult place to do ministry. The, the particular project that we were involved in, uh, the ministry was going in and they were building a three-story building and on the first floor, they were putting in a, uh, a medical clinic. On the second floor, they were putting in a, uh, a residential hall. And on the third floor, they were putting in living quarters in terms of not, not just the residential hall, but the kitchen and, and that kind of thing. You want to guess why they put the uh, medical clinic on the first floor? Anybody? Some people have trouble with their and access to clinic? No. Nope. This is, a, a Sri Lanka is an area in which if you are openly a Christian, it is a risk to your safety. I mean, literally, uh, th there are several places in the world that we deal with where, where you, you, on occasion, get back the terrible news that somebody working there has been killed. And, uh, uh, but, but in Sri Lanka, what they did was they, they built this building and they put the medical clinic on the first floor and they provided the medical services to the people in the community so that when the radicals get out and decide it's time to go burn something down and want to come to this building because they know they are working in a Christian environment, the people in the community come out and literally surround the building because this is their medical center and they don't want to lose their medical center and they don't care what's on the second and third floor, they simply don't want to lose their medical facility. So that's why they put a medical clinic on the first floor. If you think about this, what the purpose of this ministry is, is this ministry takes young ladies who have been caught in, in uh, sex trafficking and have been literally either sold by their parents into this or have been taken by somebody forcibly and have been placed into, a, uh, uh, into to, to slavery in the sex trade. Now, ask yourself the question, what does that tell you about the world view of the people who would do that? What do you think? Yeah. What do you think the ultimate goal of that is? It's money, right? It's money. It's money and power. People equate the possession of money and the things that money will buy are far more important than anything else they're doing to these young ladies. Now, think about the worldview of the people who would risk their lives to go into Sri Lanka and set this clinic up and work in this clinic knowing that they are taking young women out of this type of an environment. Because when you take them out of this environment, the people who were making the money don't like that. And it's a very risky operation. What do you think about their worldview? Yeah. Yeah. 
Human life is valued above all things. This is somebody who is, is if you think about this, these are people, one of the things that always gets me, uh, I, I've had, I've had a, a long opportunity to observe people who have been in the ministry, particularly in, in the foreign lands. There's a young man by the name of uh, uh, Luke Ryder. Luke Ryder went to, uh, he w worked with uh, Youth with a Missions. He went to South Africa for a three month uh, missions tour and he never came home. Today he's in Mozambique. The guy takes Bibles and literally walks them into the bush in Mozambique. He'll, he'll take his computer with him. He has the, uh, uh, the, the people in the community, he'll find somebody that can speak English and he has them translate the Bible by just speaking it and then they'll take the recorded MP3, they put it into a small book that looks like a Bible and then they take those MP3s back out into the bush and they start handing them out. And the last one I got was in the Shishwa language. And <clears throat> you, you turn this thing on and li you listen to it absolutely terrible quality of recording. You can't really uh, uh, understand the differences in language, but, but people suck these things up like crazy because it's the Word of God, and, and there is this natural thirst for the Word of God. But I often think about Luke in terms of, here's this young guy that was, was uh, uh, born and raised in California, down in Oceanside, went to high school in Oceanside, and, and here's a guy that you would think would want the same things that other people have in terms of the opportunity to go to college, the opportunity to get a career, the opportunity to have a family, the opportunity to have a house that, that he can go home to at night. And his choice is to live in the bush in Mozambique rather than to do all of these things. And just about the time I was thinking this once, <clears throat> I find out that a young lady from the very high school that Luke Ryder went to was a missionary with a different organization, went to Mozambique, they met in Mozambique, and now they're married. It's amazing how this stuff happens. But we have several people that we know that have, have, have been raised in this type of an environment that have chosen to go off and work in places like Sri Lanka or work in, uh, in Mozambique. One of those missionaries is a young lady by the name of Nancy Bryce. Nancy went to school here at Biola. Nancy chose to go on a three months mission tour and she went down to Guatemala, Guatemala City. And when she was down in Guatemala City, she had obtained her teaching credentials. I mean, she'd gone through the whole bit here at, at Biola to, to become a teacher. When she got to Guatemala, she didn't come back. She stayed in Guatemala City and she worked in this uh, uh, school called Escuela, uh, Escuela de... You can't help me on this one, huh? Yeah. By the way, this is, this, this is Lynn Hauer. She's my administrative director at the foundation. Uh, Escuela de los something. But anyway, uh, but she stayed there. And, and when, when she first got down there, her living quarters, the first year that she was teaching at this school in Guatemala City, was a closet. They literally cleared out a closet and put a bed down in the closet and she slept on the floor in this closet for a year. And, and she's still down there today. She met her husband, Josue, down in Guatemala and she's working in uh, uh, Antigua as a missionary. And, and you, you know, you think the same thing. But, but Guatemala is, is a perfect example of, of one of the questions that come up in regards to what is your priority and what is your worldview. Guatemala is predominantly Catholic. The area that, uh, that Nancy worked in, Guatemala City and Antigua, they have several very large Catholic churches in the area. But the Catholic church in this area has a philosophy that says that if you are poor, you are poor because God has chosen to curse you for something that you've done. And as a result of that, the church refuses to reach out to any of the poor, not just the adults, but the children. You literally get this, this position where you are locked out of the things that, that the church would normally offer to society. What does that tell you about a worldview? You agree? You disagree? Yeah. Think about this from the church's perspective. If you don't have to provide services to the poor, what does that mean to you? 
You can have incredibly nice churches. You can have incredible facilities. What is most of the money of a church supposed to be spent on? The poor. And they don't have to do this. And so it's up to other missions organizations that come to Guatemala who, who work in this type of environment to be able to do this. And, and the remarkable thing, we did, a, um, we did a project with the first school that uh, Nancy was involved in. They had a, a school down in the, uh, uh, the city. And then up in the local mountains, the, uh, the government had abandoned a school up there. Simply, they, they couldn't afford to run this thing. And so we came in and we provided the funds to get this school up and running so that this Christian school could offer, uh, uh, operate a school at this location. And it was the parents that came in and literally ran the facility. They came in and they cooked the meals for the kids. They, they cleaned the place. They kept it up to, I mean, it was, it was the parents because the parents understood they had been deprived their entire life. And here was somebody who was willing to reach out to them and their children and offer them something. <clears throat> Mozambique, we, uh, we support an orphanage in Mozambique. And uh, the, the orphanage, this is again a, uh, a young lady from First Baptist Church of Downey. She went over with uh, um, uh, Teen Missions International and went on a three month missions tour and never came home. And that was in 1997 and she's still working in the orphanage today. Uh, this is an environment in which everyone she works with is black. She is the only white within a huge geographical range. Uh, she will probably never meet a husband in the environment in which she's located. I mean, there, there are no young men of her age, whether black, white, or otherwise there. So, uh, but, but she has accepted working in this orphanage and, and feels this is her life calling. There is a, a, uh, a law in Mozambique that says when you reach the age of 18, you must leave the orphanage. They cannot keep them beyond that period of time. And uh, there is a practice in Mozambique in which by the time the children reach about 16, the young girls reach the age of 16, suddenly distant relatives show up and want to claim the young girl. I was the uncle, I was the second cousin, I was something like that. And the reason they want to claim the young girl is because then they can literally offer her as a bride and get the bride price, they call it by taking the girl and selling her as a bride to somebody. Now, ask yourself the question, what does this tell you about somebody's worldview? I mean, you can, you can look at this from the difference of, say, Sri Lanka, where they take somebody and they put them in the sex trade, and everybody, I mean, you, you cringe at the thought of that. All of these are simply degrees of the same thing. People who think money is far more important than people. People who think money is the end goal and fail to see that God created man, man and woman, in the image of God, he created them. And to, so, to somebody who has a Christian worldview, suddenly all of these things fall into perspective in terms of understanding why is it that we do what we do. I was in San Diego uh, meeting with, uh, uh, happened to be the president of Point Loma University, as a matter of oh. fact. But uh, <clears throat> I came walking out of this place, and out on the, the street, there were, uh, uh, there were uh, a young man and a young lady, and they were from the United Nations, and they were raising money for, uh, uh, for the United Nations. And I, as I walked out the door, the, the guy asked this question. He goes, how would you like to, to save lives today? And I looked at him and I said, great, let's go find the, the, the closest Planned Parenthood and shut them down. I said, we'll save 30,000 lives this year. This girl disappeared so quick you could not believe it. I mean, she was gone. We turned, my wife and I turned around and she had taken off, gone around the corner and was totally gone. The young man chose to stick around and talk to us for a while, and he was actually quite interesting because he came from a Christian family, and, and he started out by saying, look, I understand where you're coming from. My parents were, were very similar to you. You know, they had the Christian perspective and all of this, and I said, well, then why are you doing what you're doing? Why don't you go out and affect something that really looks at the value of people and not work for an organization that's going to spend 30% of every dime you raise by, by giving it away to corrupt people. 
there was um, um, <clears throat> the reason that we, we value life obviously comes from Scripture. You have the, the provisions in Genesis which talk about God created man. You have the provisions in uh, Exodus chapter 19 where it says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my commandment, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. That's what God held, his image of that which he created. They were created for a purpose, and that purpose was to be a holy nation set aside for the purposes of having a relationship with him. So how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that we do. One is, is basically philosophy. What is it that you hold to be important, right? We, at, at the foundation, we break our grants down into a number of different categories. We look in terms of the things that we give money to. Uh, for example, we, we support probably in the area of nine different Christian colleges. So it's not just Biola, Point Loma, Westmont, APU. Uh, we provide funds to a lot of Christian colleges. Why do we do that? Well, I can go into a church, for example, and I can completely equip their, the office in that church with computers. And if I do that, I understand that the effective life of that grant is between three to five years. The effective life of those computers are literally between three to five years. If, however, we train up someone to follow the Lord, and particularly when you train up leaders to follow the Lord, the effectiveness of that grant lasts 40, 50, 60 years. We have a, uh, an intern program at the, uh, at the foundation, and what we do is we take young men and women who are in college that are set for a, a, uh, a life of vocational ministry. They can either be in undergraduate or in a graduate program in seminary, and we will take them and we will place them for two years in a church to work and we tell them very specifically when we do this. We don't do this for the purpose of creating super pastors or preachers or anything along those lines. We put them there for the purpose of allowing them the opportunity to determine God's call in their life. And, and I tell them right up front, I meet with every one of them before they come into the program, and I tell them, look, if, if during this program you get the sense that God is calling you to something else, you're going to be a dentist, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a roofer, you're going to be anything else, I can assure you God will use all of the experiences he has poured into your life to that point in time as effectively in that career as he will in ministry if that's where God is calling you. And so our purpose is simply to allow them the opportunity to see where it is that God is calling them. And it's our belief that by doing that and investing our funds in that way, literally, you'll have a return. Does that mean my clock is over? No. You'll have a return for many years. We have been running this program since 1978. And Southern California is literally dotted with senior pastors who came through the Stamps Intern Program. And, and we are now on something like fourth and fifth generation churches. Churches where they started out with a, a intern who became a senior pastor, who got an intern who became a senior pastor, who got an intern who became a senior pastor, and we're four generations down the road at this point in time with people, pastors, who have come up through the program in that, that means. And so what this does is it, it reflects our commitment to what is important. And, and the importance that we, we hold uh, are two. First, there can never be any question that bringing someone to Christ is the most valuable thing you can ever do in their life. I, I was up at uh, um, Hume Lake three weeks ago. I think it was three weeks ago. And, and I met with Mike, Mike Anthony. Mike was a uh, provost here. Was he the provost? Associate provost. Associate provost. And then a year ago, he left to take the position as executive director at, at Hume Lake. And, uh, and Mike was sharing with me, he was, he was telling us about this program that they had where they bring 
uh, high school football teams up from the valley down below. And th when they bring the football teams up, they, they let the football teams kind of uh, train against each other. But in the process, they bring up NFL players who are Christians. And then the NFL players not only help coach them during the day, but at night, they give speeches or, or talks on Christianity and why they should become a Christian. And he says it's a remarkable program and highly influential. And he has this one card that he has on his desk that, that's underneath this uh, glass uh, plate that's on his desk. And he was telling me it was a young man who had come up that year and had uh, accepted Christ. And this card was an explanation of, of the difference that Christ did, you know, in terms of, yes, I accepted Christ. I, I understand the decision I've made, all of this, right? And, and then he tells me, he says, he goes, that young man went back down to the valley and 30 days later, he was killed in a drive-by shooting. Now, think about how valuable that moment at Hume Lake was in that young man's life. There was nothing else that was more important. So what we do at the foundation, our bylaws specify that 50% of all of the funds that we invest have to be invested in youth activities. And we define youth activities all the way from, from uh, churches that offer kids programs, uh, all the way up through uh, you know, grammar schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges, up to the age of 25. We take youth into that, that co complexity. And half of our money is spent one way or another on youth with the understanding that if you read the statistics, 80% of all people who ultimately accept Christ do so before they get out of that time frame. And so that time frame is of critical importance. The next thing that we do then is we look in terms of the value of training up people, training up the leaders that are coming in the next generation. I will tell you, having had the opportunity to go through the period from the 70s all the way up through the current time, my generation did an absolutely miserable job of raising up leaders. What happened was in, in the 70s in particular, in the early 80s, my generation literally fled from the church. If, if you read the statistics, what you find is that my generation was the rebellious generation. My generation was the one that, that backed out of the church and stayed away from the church until about the early 90s. And in the early 90s, we started coming back to church in groves. You know why? We had kids. We had kids. And, and suddenly, we as parents start looking around and asking, who's going to teach all these little hellions morals? And that's what caused my generation to literally flood back to church. Now, if you think about this, a gap of the late 70s through the early 90s within which this happens, a significant thing takes place during that period of time. When we came back to church, we didn't know the difference between a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, an Episcopal church, none of them. We couldn't tell you the difference. And so when we came back to church, what we came looking for was not doctrine. What we came looking for was, do you have a basketball league? Do you offer yoga? Do you have Overeaters Anonymous? Do you have AA? What kind of programs do you have that will keep my kids occupied so I can breathe for an afternoon? This was the difference that took place when my generation came back. This is where you began to see the, the, uh, the incredible upswing of the community church because my generation didn't look for the name on the door in terms of a Baptist church or a Methodist church. In fact, in many cases, those names scared them away because they didn't know what the doctrine was. And so you have large churches that used to be a Baptist church that suddenly became the community church, the friendlier church, the church that was inviting to them. Well, part of the difficulty that occurred was that my generation, as a result of walking away from the church, we were never mentored by our parents. As, as a whole, this is a true statement. You're always going to get some that, that break the mold, but as a whole, my generation was not mentored by our parents' generation. What impact do you think that has? We don't know how to mentor. We can't do it. I, it, you would be stunned to see the number of people that I run into, particularly, say, for example, in the intern program, where we're evaluating a church for the purpose of putting an intern into a given church.
And, and the people of my generation are reading books trying to figure out how to mentor the next generation. What kind of an impact do you think that has upon the church universal? Good luck developing your next leaders. The biggest problem that churches have today is that they have this lack of leadership that has been developed, particularly during the last 10 years. And now you have this very old group of guys with white hair that are running churches, looking for somebody to take it over, and there's nobody standing there behind them ready to do it. And so you're dropping down an entire generation looking for very young people like your age to step up and now provide leadership without the opportunity of going through a stage where you have the privilege of sitting back and watching leadership develop and train you. So part of what we do on behalf of the foundation is we understand that there is a dire need for the development of leadership and a lot of the funds that we invest, we invest in that area in terms of leadership development. And we do it specifically because we understand if we invest money in developing leaders, particularly at your age, that investment will come back and will pay benefits to the kingdom of God for 40 years or longer. Okay, um, <clears throat> one of the things I always tell my interns when, when uh, they first uh, get into the program, we have an installation service that we do for all of our interns so that the churches will recognize that they are there for a purpose of ministry and that they're set aside for the purpose of ministry. And one of the things I always tell my interns is that <clears throat> just because we cut the check and deliver it to the church, that doesn't mean that the obligation of stewardship is over. We take our responsibility very, very serious that God has entrusted to us the responsibility of being stewards over the funds that we invest. The Stamps Foundation is probably the closest thing I have ever heard of on a modern day uh, as an equivalent of the fish in the loaves. The foundation started in 1963. It was fully funded by 1971. In 1971, it was funded for a total of $2.8 million. To date, we have given away $37 million, and we have almost $30 million still under investment, all coming from $2.1 million or $2.8 million. I mean, it's been an amazing story. We give it away, and God replenishes it. And I'm certain that the reason that God has done that is because the trustees who have worked at this foundation have been very dedicated and, and conscientious Christians who have been faithful in understanding their responsibilities of stewardship. But what I tell the young interns is, just because we cut that check and deliver it to the church doesn't mean the responsibility of stewardship is over. What it means is the responsibility of stewardship has shifted, that now, God has invested that money in his life or her life, and someday God is going to ask for an accounting. What did you do with that which I invested in your life? And I also tell the, the, the interns, it's not just money. If, if you look at what happens during a two-year period of time with an intern, the, the pastors are going to invest their time, talents, and skills with this intern in terms of training them and teaching them and raising them up to be leaders that, that will, will serve God well. The members of the congregation invest their time. They pray for them. They're there to talk to them. They're there to befriend them. But the members of the congregation invest in their lives also. So what God is expecting a return on is not just the money, Money. It's everything that he has invested in their life during that two-year period of time. The same thing applies to each of you as you go through this school. If you look around at this campus, this is a, this is a remarkable school. It has technology and buildings that are uh, state-of-the-art, and they have been paid for by other people who have invested in this school because they believe that this school can generate and produce young men and women who will serve God well. You have administrators, you have teachers, you have uh, people that work in, in the office, all of which invest their lives in the lives of the students that go here. Your parents have invested well in paying for your education here. 
Every one of the scholarships that you get here at the school were donated by someone who understood that your life will be something that can be used of God for many years to come. Um, I remember Clyde Cook very well. I don't know if you guys probably were not here when Clyde Cook was here. Clyde was, Clyde was a remarkable man. And uh, Clyde came up through the school. He played basketball for Biola. Uh, he was a student. He was a professor. He worked his way up to administration and ultimately became the president of the university. Clyde Cook was one of those people that was just a delight to know and, and to be able to, uh, uh, to, to call a friend. Clyde Cook was exactly what God intended to be through the investment of everything that was poured into his life. Someday, God is going to ask each of you for an accounting of that which is presently being invested in your life. And to understand how you will use that, you have to ask yourself, what's your worldview? How important is it that you consider money? Or are there other things that God holds out as being far more important? Only you will be able to answer that question. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.